Good afternoon. I'm Pat Living with the Department of Health and Social Services and your moderator for the COVID-19 update for Wednesday, January 13th. We are joined today by Yukon Premier, the Honourable Sandy Silver, and the Yukon's Chief Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Brendan Hanley. Once again, our sign language interpreter, Mary Thiessen, and André Boursier from French Language Services Directorate have joined us. Following our speakers, we will go to the phone lines for questions from reporters. We will call you by name, and you will each have two questions. Before we begin with our speakers, I'd like to verify that everyone can hear us. If any of the reporters are having a problem, please email eco at gov.yk.ca. Premier Silver. Thanks very much, Pat. Thank you, everybody, for joining us here on the traditional territory of the Kwanlin Dun First Nation and the Ta'an Kwachin Council. I'm very pleased to be here again with uh, Dr. Henley and, uh, and Mary uh, to update uh, Yukoners on our current COVID situation in Yukon. I would uh, like to take a moment as well to, to acknowledge recent events in our territory. Uh, the community of Mayo has uh, suffered a uh, major loss, and our thoughts and prayers are with that community uh, today. We send them love, support uh, to the community at this time. I would also like to acknowledge the recent fire in Whitehorse, and I understand that a majority of the residents uh, have now been able to return safely to their homes, which is good news. Uh, Yukoners share so many connections, and I, and I know that uh, these events are, are affecting uh, many in our territory. So uh, again, um, our hearts go out to folks that are uh, uh, involved, uh, but uh, again, please reach out if you, uh, if you need help. The help is available and supports are available. Um, Vaccines, uh, Yukon's vaccine efforts uh, are moving ahead very quickly. Uh, the dedicated and hardworking team of health professionals continue to administer vaccines to Yukon's most vulnerable uh, populations and also frontline workers. At the end of the day yesterday, uh, 685 people received the first dose of the Moderna vaccine. We know that our next shipment of vaccines will arrive this week. Uh, this will be another allotment of 7,200 vaccines. This new shipment will help uh, to keep us moving forward with our immunization plans. The online appointment booking system is now open. Uh, it is available for people in Watson Lake, Beaver Creek, and Old Crow for right now. Uh, bookings for appointments in Whitehorse will begin in the coming days and will start with vulnerable people and those over, four, uh, over 70 years of age. To avoid an overload of bookings, the system will be open two weeks of bookings at a time. On Monday, the mobile team will begin immunizing people in Watson Lake. There will be, uh, they will be in the community on Monday and Tuesday. On Thursday, immunizations will be offered in Beaver Creek, and on Friday, they'll be offered in Old Crow. In advance of the clinics opening in these communities, vaccine teams have been working closely with local leadership uh, and agencies to ensure a smooth rollout. Information about these rural community clinics will continue to be shared with First Nations, governments, and mayors in the communities and will be shared broadly with all Yukoners. We are working very hard to reach all Yukoners with key details about the vaccine clinic dates and times. Look for information to be shared online, via social media, on the radio, and in the territory's newspapers, and of course, during these weekly updates. I strongly encourage everyone in these first three communities, and in every community, who is eligible to get immunized. There is no greater community action that you can do these days than signing up for a vaccine. The goal is to protect everyone and to stop the spread of COVID-19, which means it is most effective if everyone who is eligible gets vaccinated. We are working towards getting 75% of the adult population vaccinated over the next few months. On Monday, the clinic in Whitehorse will also be open for certain groups. For, the, for these first weeks in Whitehorse, immunization will be a, uh, available to high-risk health care uh, workers who may care for or be in contact with COVID-19 patients. Uh, older adults starting with 70 years and older, uh, people who are marginalized and living in group settings like the Whitehorse Emergency Shelter and Whitehorse Correctional Center. Uh, there is 
This is absolutely great news, and I'm very happy uh, uh, with how uh, the vaccination teams, how hard they're working uh, to keep the vaccines rolling out. As we continue this effort, remember, we all have a role to play in keeping the territory safe and healthy. And I've said this many times, and I'll say it again, the best thing that Yukoners can do to prevent the virus from spreading uh, now and through the vaccine uh, rollout uh, is to practice the safe six. Wash your hands often, maintain that physical distancing, staying at home if you're sick, traveling responsibly and respectfully, self-isolating as required, and also following the guidelines, the gathering guidelines that are in place, including limiting indoor gatherings to 10 people. Now, I've said this so many times, I'm saying it quick, sorry, Mary. Uh, I've been saying that so many times that I, that I must stress this again. Please continue to practice the safe six plus one. Mask up when you're in public. Yukoners, Again, uh, we're still not out of the woods, and COVID-19 continues to be a risk uh, to each and every one of us, and we must all do what we can to reduce the spread of this virus. Uh, before I pass things off to Dr. Handley, uh, I want to remind UConners that the vaccine schedule continues uh, and information will be updated on UConn.ca. Uh, I appreciate that there are people who are anxious about getting the vaccine, uh, and that's wonderful. Um, it, it, that I think a lot of people are really anxious and really looking forward to when it's their time and when it's their turn. Um, there will be an opportunity for everyone who is eligible to get vaccinated when your, when your turn comes. The Yukon government will share information about why you should get vaccinated. If you're not certain, evaluate the facts and use trusted sources to educate yourself about the vaccine. The development of COVID-19 vaccine, vaccines has, uh, has seemed fast, uh, but this does not mean that safety has been compromised. Uh, as you wait for your turn to be vaccinated, stay vigilant, Yukoners. And please remember again to be kind, patient, and respectful and excellent to one another. Uh, so thank you very much uh, for listening for this part of the update and turn things over to Dr. Hanley. Thank you, Premier Silver. Good afternoon. Bonjour. Bon après-midi, everyone. And uh, like the Premier, I want to first acknowledge how difficult a week it has been for some, some Yukoners, particularly those in the community of Mayo and, and, and in Whitehorse. For my update, I want to focus uh, briefly on the uh, antibody test kits that people are, um, people, some people have received and lots of people are asking about. Um, and uh, then really to bring our focus on to the, um, the vaccine rollout and elaborate on some of the points that the, that the Premier has made. First, a little bit of a case update. We remain with the two family household clusters previously identified and they're, they're all doing well. So we have six active cases still and, and no new cases. All of those young people who were instructed to self-isolate uh, when we were talking about this last week have since been able to resume regular activities after the individual with a preliminary positive test turned out to be negative on the gold standard PCR testing. So I'm pleased that as part of our contact investigations last week, we did take that proactive approach to a suspected case avoiding the possible spread of virus throughout the territory, and that remains our ongoing goal and approach. Every now and then I hear someone speculate about that illness that they had back in the spring or even last winter and wonder, could that have been COVID when I had aches and pains and a cough? And, and that's the question that the recently launched StatsCan survey is trying to help answer. You may have recently heard on the news of people around the country receiving packages requesting a blood sample. And I've received some questions about, is this something legit? Is this a, is this a scam? So yes, this is in fact a legitimate survey launched by Statistics Canada. And StatsCan began sending out kits including gloves and alcohol swabs and a needle to poke your finger and a, a filter paper for a, a blood spot sample. And this is part of a national survey to determine how much COVID-19 infection is out there, apart from what we already know from the testing results that we see every day. 
48,000 Canadians, including 1,000 Yukoners, have been selected randomly to do a COVID antibody test. And the test will determine whether in the past you may have unknowingly cap, uh, contracted, contracted COVID-19 and then match that to any symptoms that you may have had in the past using a questionnaire. For those already vaccinated, it, it will also help to identify whether antibodies are present as the result of receiving immunization. This test will be used for research purposes and of course is completely optional. But this is a great chance for us to get some extra information on what COVID activity might or could have taken place in Yukon without us knowing. If you receive a test kit and choose to take part, all the information will remain confidential. Once you send in your test, you'll receive your, your results, your own results, a few weeks later. And all results and personal data will be protected under the Federal Statistics Act. And that study will continue until March uh, 2021. <clears throat> well, there's been so much activity and excitement this week about COVID-19 immunizations as we enter our second week of the campaign. We're well underway with immunizations for long-term care residents and staff. The first trip into Dawson was today to cover McDonald Lodge and frontline health care workers there. And today, Whitehorse General Hospital is also busy vaccinating their frontline staff with a fantastic uptake. Meanwhile, the two mobile teams are finishing their preparations for their community campaigns uh, beginning next week and the mass immunization clinic in Whitehorse will open for elders and some specified vulnerable populations. Uptake so far has been great, and I've heard of very few people holding back or hesitating. But as we look forward, we have to acknowledge that while some are almost knocking down the doors to get vaccine, not everyone may be ready to step forward right now. That's normal, and we'll continue to support you with what you need to get you to come forward. I hope that as more people get vaccinated around the country, around the world, as well as locally, and as we continue to publish more information about the Moderna vaccine, and we learn from the rapidly growing global experience of the vaccine, that people will feel more and more comfortable to step forward. We have been navigating our way through this pandemic for almost a year, and any progress towards renormalizing our society will depend on a maximal uptake of the vaccine. We all want and need to get back to that time when we can reopen our economies, welcome visitors and tourists, re-engage with each other in the ways that, as innate social beings, we need to in order to thrive. Achieving herd immunity is a critical part of that success. We are working hard, as are people around the world, on how we can plan for easing public health measures when we have a vaccinated population but we need to have that achieved. A population which we can say has enough vaccine in arms to prevent circulation and significant transmission of COVID-19. Our goal is that COVID-19 becomes just another one of those occasional illnesses rather than an epidemic threat that holds us all at gunpoint. Many of us have not seen a pandemic take place in our lifetime. It's an unusual time that typically leads to some hesitation and uncertainty. And we deal with uncertainty every day for sure. But to reemerge safely over the weeks ahead, we need Yukoners to stand up and lead the charge, encouraging those around us to receive the vaccine. Otherwise, 2021 could be much more similar to 2020 than any of us would like. As the Premier says, immunization is extremely safe and effective. All vaccines go through a, rigor a rigorous regulatory scientific review process for safety, quality, and efficacy at Health Canada before being distributed to the, to the public. And as our elder Agnes Mills said last week, we would not be here today without vaccines. Of course, in Yukon, we have been counting our blessings. We have fared well in comparison to other jurisdictions throughout Canada, not yet feeling the brunt of this second wave anywhere near to the extent that others have. Because of this, it's possible that some people may not see the need to get the vaccine. Our risk, however, of contracting COVID-19 is still high, as is the risk of importing the virus, um, and, and we know how contagious this virus can be once it gets here. 
Hospitals are nearly at full capacity in areas like Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Ontario, Alberta. The statistics tell us that currently 4% of the Canadian population has contracted the virus. One in 13 has been hospitalized. One in 10 may feel long-term effects of the virus. And unfortunately, one in 40 people with confirmed COVID infection have died. Compare these risks to the promise that the Moderna vaccine offers with a safety profile that is remarkable. Of course, there are adverse effects, such as pain at the site of injection, possibly a fever post immunization, as well as the possibility of severe allergic reaction, although a very rare occurrence. Allergic reactions can be treated on the spot at any site where Moderna vaccine is being offered. These effects are mere inconveniences compared to the enormous benefits of preventing COVID infection. Post-marketing surveillance means that we don't re rely only on clinical trials to know these vaccines and their potential for side effects. As the vaccines continue to go into thousands and millions of arms, there have been no reports of unexpected side effects to date. This is good news. We need to consider this and weigh our risk of contracting COVID-19 versus our risk of immunization. We know that although Yukon remains in a steady place right now, this can change in a matter of days to weeks. On the other hand, within just three months from now, we can see our population approach herd immunity, a chance that very few places in Canada have. As long as our vaccine supplies come in as scheduled, we are set up for a campaign that will be remarkable for pace towards that 75% or higher goal. If we fail as a community, we have to live with the risk of seeing our community thrown into further disruption by a wave of COVID-19. We continue, of course, to roll out the vaccinations and the pace will be picking up significantly in the days and weeks ahead. This week is about finishing our long-term care sites for their first doses and adding immunization for healthcare workers involved in frontline care of people who may have been exposed or may have been maybe harboring COVID-19 infection. Next week is our move into the communities along with certain vulnerable populations in Whitehorse. There are many ways to define who is more vulnerable to COVID infection or to the consequences of infection. People may be more susceptible to COVID-19 because of their age, because of where they live and who they live with, because of health conditions or socioeconomic status. All of these factors heighten the likelihood of an individual's risk of contracting the virus or having complications from the virus. To preserve our workforce for the people protecting us all from COVID infection, we're also covering our frontline healthcare workers, whether at testing sites, in EMS, the hospitals, or in public health and community nursing. We are already covering long-term care staff as we go through the various long-term care sites. Again, I want to emphasize that within as the Premier says, within a matter of weeks, any adult who would like the vaccine will have a chance to get it. We are organizing the Mass Clinic in Whitehorse to get as many people as possible through day by day. We are not in the situation that the provinces are when they have insufficient vaccine, so they need to prioritize certain populations for this first quarter of 2021 and ask others to wait. We will get to everyone. But for the purposes of organization and efficiency and acknowledging that there are certain risks that do take precedence, we are proceeding in a certain order. The two key questions, therefore, are how old are you and what setting do you live in? For an individual, by far the biggest risk factor is age. The older you are, the more likely you are to get severe COVID-19 and to die from COVID-19 disease. Age in itself is a much more important predictor than other conditions such as chronic medical conditions or immunocompromise. Second, there are certain settings where we worry more about the risk of outbreaks or widely circulating COVID-19 virus. That includes our rural communities and what we call congregate settings, such as the Whitehorse Emergency Shelter and the Whitehorse Corrections. 
people who live in marginalized conditions as well fall into this category, either because they are individually more susceptible or because they are living in unstable settings where spread of COVID infection may, may happen more easily. That is why our current focus is on these groups, older individuals, communities, group settings, and marginalized individuals. So starting next week, booking will be available um, as it is this week uh, as well for the high-risk healthcare workers who may be caring for or in contact with COVID-19 patients. And uh, next week, the older adults starting with 70 years and older will be added as well as those people I mentioned, people who are marginalized and living in group settings, such as the Whitehorse Emergency Shelter and Whitehorse Correctional Center. All of the other categories that I mentioned will be covered once the February 10th clinics in Whitehorse are open. Until then, we will be concentrating ensure, on ensuring that our elders have every opportunity to get vaccines earlier, starting with citizens 70 plus and working our way downward by age bracket until we get either vacancies in booking or get to February 10th. That, in a nutshell, I hope, explains our, priori our prioritization process. As we open up the Whitehorse Mass Immunization Clinic, individuals will be asked to register and book an appointment. I think as of today, we're unable to accept bookings via telephone, but bookings I know will be available very soon through a call center. And bookings can be made online if you're identified as a priority group per the schedule. As the Premier said, when, you're, when your time in those next two weeks is, is due. So to book online, you must visit the yukon.ca. This is our shot, and that's linked from the main COVID website now. And then you input your Yukon healthcare number. Um, if you wish to book via telephone, then I think beginning Thursday, yeah, with the beginning Thursday, that will be available. So I think uh, hopefully that gives an overall um, kind of snapshot of where we are and of the vaccine um, prioritization, prioritization process uh, for UConn. And remember that we are really putting everything we can into getting 75% of UConners or more to be vaccinated um, as, a, as a, our goal. Um, and that is our real, real baseline before we contemplate further steps around uh, public health measures. As the Premier said, always remember, meanwhile, the safe six plus one. Use your mask as well as all the steps that the Premier outlined. And this is the best way to protect ourselves from COVID-19 and until we get uh, well past that point of a vaccinated community. That's all for my update. Thank you. Merci, merci, chou. And remember to take care of each other and stay well. Thank you both. We'll move now to the phone line and we'll begin with Luke, CKRW. Hi, uh, Dr. Henley. By the time that the, uh, that the vaccine clinic in Whitehorse opens for the general adult population, uh, it will also be, at least according to the manufacturer's timeline, uh, the time for our long-term care residents to get their second shot. Do you anticipate uh, that happening on time, people in long-term care facilities receiving their second dose? Yes, so that's very much part of the planning, of course, that, and that's, that speaks to some of the complexity um, of uh, planning, a, uh, planning a kind of a, a whole population approach to, um, to COVID-19 vaccination, recognizing that it's a two-dose two vaccine. So, of course, factoring into all of these timelines and projections is the need for people to get their second dose on time. And, and since you bring up the second dose, I'll, I'll just mention that the uh, the NASI, the National Advisory Committee on Immunization, has just yesterday uh, published their revised recommendations for second dose timing, where they're um, allowing, given all of the operational um, realities that that we're facing with limited supplies and the need to get a vaccine out as quickly as possible, uh, that there is a, a little bit of a, a comfort margin with that 28-day dose. Um, so we're all trying to, to get uh, to stay close 
to 28 days, but recognizing that there is a, a six week um, allowance, as it were, where we can be very comfortable. It's likely a lot longer, um, but uh, so far the, the evidence is very firm that we have, um, we have kind of a six week margin. That gives us a little bit of a wiggle room to play with, say, um, in either the, the, the scheduling to, to allow us to continue to use those doses um, or uh, for individuals, if for whatever reason they can't make that 28 days, we know that there is some comfort, uh, comfort margin there. Thank you. Luke, do you have a follow-up question? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, just with all of that being said, is there, uh, is there sort of roughly a percentage of how effective just that first dose is uh, with regards to protection against COVID-19? Yeah, that's that's a it's a great question, and it's kind of a complicated one. And I'm I'm told that I need to hurry up a little bit, but <laughs> <laughs> um, so I won't take all day to answer like I would love to. But um, the the there is actually very good. Uh, limited but very promising data that shows the first dose m might actually be very effective. The, the problem is we then get into the how long is it very effective for. And it's, and, it, and it's really based on some of the evidence, especially from the Moderna trial, that if you, if you take out the people who were actually incubating infection, because there were a few, uh, while they got vaccinated, um, if you remove those people, you'll find that the, those who got their first dose where I, I think it was in that 92 percent um, uh, effectiveness for not getting um, for not for not getting um, COVID infection in in the interval between their first and their second dose. So that so that looks very promising. Of course, again that that wasn't that that was almost like a a byproduct. It wasn't one of the the goals of the the phase three um, uh, trials, but but. Uh, you can say that th that first dose looks probably to be very effective, but for an uncertain duration of time. And we know that that second dose is necessary to nail down. So we really need, to, and, that, and what that does is it gives that booster to the first dose. So it kind of solidifies the immune response, but it also then adds in that, that durability so that, that then we know that we're good, at least for as long as we can follow. So far, we're good to three months, likely to be longer as time from those first from those phase three trials goes on, we'll get more information on what's the expected duration of the two-dose vaccination. Thank you. We'll move to Danielle, CBC. Yeah, hi. Um, you were saying that, you know, as more people get vaccinations, we can start looking at an easing of restrictions. Um, one question I've heard is, once people are fully vaccinated, will they still need to quarantine after traveling? Yes. So I will say, uh, for the time being, everything is still in place. Um, and but but these are these are really important questions, and there are there are being examined not just by our team, um, but but again, these these are national questions and even international questions to answer. So, and, and part of it really rests on that. Um, First of all, real life effectiveness. So we know that uh, 94, 95 percent is the affected, is the expected efficacy of the vaccine. We also want to show that in real life. So as again, as some of this experience gives us data, we'll be more sure of our actual, actual on the ground, real world effectiveness of the vaccine. The second, how long does it last? Um, and um, and what about transmission? How does it? Uh, can we be sure that it prevents asymptomatic infection and? Transmission, and so once we have more information on that, then we can start to apply it to. Okay, well, what does that mean for for travel? What does it mean for quarantine? What does it mean for when you're a contact of a case? There are really so many questions that still require a clarity. None of which should stop us from getting vaccine into arms. But these are things that I think will become more clear as we get more data and, and then do the appropriate analysis to then go back into all of our policies and public health measures and uh, hopefully revise them accordingly. Danielle, do you have a follow-up? Yeah, uh, I, I guess to, to clarify what you were saying there is just that there will be no changes to self-isolation as of yet. Correct. 
Move to Chris at CBC. Um, oh, sorry, Danielle. Did you have a second? Another question? Uh, I believe Danielle had a, a, a further question there. Okay, we've just gone back. Yeah, that was just a clarification. Sorry, Danielle. Please go ahead. Did I ask my second question? Yes, please go ahead. Mm -hmm. Okay. We're seeing people in the Facebook comments asking about what constitutes as being high risk, what constitutes as being a vulnerable person. Um, say, for example, if you're 18 and immunocompromised, if you're younger and you have chronic illness, can you kind of lay out a bit what it, what it means to be part of a high risk or vulnerable population that's going to go first? Are there any things that people are going to have to meet or any forms they're going to have to use to prove this? So this goes back into um, to what I was uh, trying to explain by by exactly what we mean by um, by vulnerable in terms of the the schedule um, going ahead. So all of those, uh, and again, there are many ways that we can kind of, kind of slice that in terms of who who is uh, vulnerable. At the same time, we are trying to get our whole population vaccinated in as quickly um, a time as we can manage uh, with that goal of seventy five percent of the adult population so really that we we in some ways we don't really have to go into the the, the nuances of trying to make those decisions because um, our primary focus is on age going through those age gradations um, and then uh, and then going into the mass immunization when people will be able to make their booking at the at convenient times uh, for them and uh, and then we can go through the the, the whole population. Um, and really, the ultimate goal again uh, by by the end of March into the beginning of April to have uh, to have everyone that um, is coming forward taken care of. Thank you. Now we'll move to Chris from CBC. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I'm interested to ask, I, I guess, both Dr. Hanley and Premier Silver, just about uh, the issue of, of rolling out. Uh, the vaccine in particularly some of the smaller communities. What sort of challenges um, are you seeing in terms of uh, both communicating uh, to people in the smaller communities and also to, to nail down places that are suitable to run these vaccine clinics? Yeah, uh, I, I can start. Uh, excellent question, Chris. Um, interestingly enough, I just got off the phone with a, a particular individual in a particular community uh, who's on the other side, uh, you know, in that community helping with the vaccine rollouts. And it's things like some communities have gone through civic addressing, some communities haven't. Um, you know, making sure that we have uh, information getting out to people that are maybe less social than others as far as their ability to access social media, uh, those types of things. The good news in, in those conversations when I'm asking these individuals how they think it's going. Uh, the first thing they say is the the impeccable job that the that the team is doing uh, to to uh, relay information, and and it takes that community to receive that information. So the information being passed from uh, chiefs and councils, councillors, and mayors and councillors, you know, we really are relying on them to help us with the outreach to the communities. We've heard mayors being interviewed uh, on on your channel um, in this week as well. Talking about uh, again helping us to say when it's my turn, of course I'm going to get the vaccine, and promoting the uh, the efficacy and uh, the safety of of the of the uh, vaccinations. Uh, but uh, but ultimately, yeah, every community is different. Um, you know, we have some communities like mine in Dawson City and in Watson Lake that have hospitals, and therefore uh, more uh, people in the community working in health and social services, working uh, in the medical fields, and then other communities that have uh, more limited resources. So. Uh, I would say that each community has its own unique challenges and, and circumstances, uh, and the way that these vaccines are being rolled out by having Beaver Creek and Watson Lake being a big and a small rural community, uh, that will really help us to define uh, some of the issues in these communities as we get into the bigger, uh, to, into the more, uh, into the rest of, uh, of, of those rural communities as well. Thank you, Dr. Henley. Yeah, I'll just uh, I, I completely agree, and I'll just add, um, you know, listening to Mathia Latini this morning on again on on CBC, um, who um, is the CYFN COVID um, c community uh, connector operator. 
sorry, Mathieu, I'm forgetting your actual title, but you just seem to do everything for making things happen in the communities. And uh, and I think it just speaks to that important role that, that uh, CYFN and all of the First Nations are playing. Um, of course, we have many direct uh, conversations ongoing, um, but we also have these very involved, quite detailed, one-by-one um, -one community conversations that are, that are happening as communities are getting close to their turn. The support of uh, leadership. Uh, we also, um, these partnerships, I think, are just uh, remarkable in how they're playing out and helping, but um, the um, emergency, emergency Coordination Center of Community Services, they are sending in teams ahead of time um, to get ready uh, for um, for the immunization itself in terms of getting the, the place set up, in terms of doing those, again, on-the-ground conversations. They've been um, incredibly uh, su uh, supportive and, and helpful in just, you know, venue selection and in conversation with the community, making sure the IT uh, support is there. These, the, you know, the more you learn about these operations, it's um, the, the complexities are amazing, and the fact that we're actually there and, and things are happening, it's it, it really is uh, exciting. But uh, takes uh, takes a whole, literally takes a community to make this happen. Thank you. Follow up question, Chris. Yeah, I guess the follow-up is, could you be specific about, I guess, what the sort of baseline needs are uh, in terms of infrastructure or space in terms of establishing uh, a vaccine clinic? And uh, and then to tack on to that, how many communities is this going to be an issue in terms of, of finding adequate space? Yeah, uh, I could I could start if you want. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I look at it as a, a a big parallel going back in time to when we were uh, getting businesses to start rolling out again and having guidelines and plans at that time. You know, it's a matter of um, folks that are in line, uh, making sure that they are uh, in in the right protocols for being in line. People that are waiting. Uh, again, establishing the online booking system is key as well, so that people aren't all showing up at one time. Uh, making sure that people are are safely distanced. Uh, those types of things. We really wanted to have a conversation, and this was, you know, under the guidance of Dr. Hanley. We need to talk to the First Nations and the municipalities first, uh, and then work with them to establish uh, where these clinics are going to be best uh, suited uh, in each of those communities. And uh, and I think that that was basically a, just coordinating in the same way that we did when it came to businesses being able to reopen safely. We now have to identify uh, buildings that are safe, uh, secure, uh, that could also have guidelines in place and signage in place and making sure that we do everything we can to uh, keep not only the, the, the clients, the folks that are coming in to get the vaccine safe, but also the frontline workers uh, who are either doing the administrative side of things or the, uh, or the injections themselves. Yeah, so um, again, just to elaborate a little bit, I, I, if you think of how the the, um, the Whitehorse Flu Clinic um, at the convention center and then really just scaling that, that down, but all of those elements need to take place. So you need an agreed upon space that's adequate to, uh, to bring in the number of uh, people that is uh, necessary and to allow that COVID safe uh, flow to occur. So of course, you also need people to do that. You need, it's not just the immunizers, of course, it's the the greeters and the the security and the support um, to to uh, to allow for that all to happen efficiently, so that people are taken care of and you know rapidly and and get their shot and and then have their little fifteen minutes to wait and then they're gone. And so that so the booking process plays so importantly into that, so that people do have a a time. The IT support uh, we have uh, a, a live registry, so every uh, immunization is uh, ideally entered as the immunization takes place so that so that IT support uh, and then backup plans for should there be you know should there be a, uh, a failure of the the technology or, or, or the, the web that you do have those backup plans in place so that you don't lose your your data of course then the communications that goes into it which is uh, all of what we just talked about the the upfront conversations ongoing conversations the the written materials the websites uh, all of all of that. So, thank you. We'll move to Marine Arboreal. Merci. Je n'ai pas de questions aujourd'hui. Merci, Marine. We'll move to Tim at Whitehorse Star. Yes. Hello. 
Uh, my question uh, is probably more for Dr. Hanley, but anybody can answer. So my first question is, when you talk about the booking process, uh, what happens if, uh, say, you're a new resident of the Yukon, you don't have a Yukon health card yet, or any of the people who might want to slip in from the peripheral BC communities that are allowed in, uh, can they come in and get a shot? And if so, how do they arrange that? Yeah, so there are two, uh, well, two parts to that. Um, so really, uh, most m most people living here have a Yukon healthcare card. So that, that's kind of the really the baseline. But but we realize that, yes, not everyone does. And if people are living here or working here, then they are going to be eligible. So there are other, if you, if you don't have your healthcare card, but you have a, a, a provincial card, then you would use that one or uh, some other way of establishing uh, identity. So really, you can be count you can be counted, you can be supported for a second dose, um, and and get all of the right information and um, and and the consent and all of that. So, the second part of that uh, was yeah, there we do have. Um, we do have service agreements with um, um, uh, places such as um, Lower Post um, and. Um, uh, Good Hope Lake for uh, so those those communities will be covered as part of the Watson Lake um, community visit uh, um, and then we have other other places where we don't have sort of written contracted service agreements but we are working out ways to ensure that some of those uh, border communities um, are um, are also covered um, and so some of those conversations we haven't completed yet but where we are working really hard to ensure for, for instance that the people of at have um, have access to uh, vaccine as well. Of course, they are in another jurisdiction, so it requires a lot of very close uh, coordination with our counterparts in uh, BC Northern Health. Do you have a follow-up, Tim? Yes, I do. I, again, this is probably for Dr. Hanley. I've had a couple of readers uh, contact me who are concerned about allergic reactions to the vaccine, and they're having some trouble getting the information they need. So. If, uh, especially if you have a history of allergic reactions, uh, if you go to one of these clinics, are the people there going to be prepared to deal with any potential serious or severe allergic reactions? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, and I think if you uh, if you now look online, because uh, again, some of the information is really uh, now becoming more uh, more and more is being posted um, as we get this information gathered. Uh, there is uh, a kind of a two pager, you might say, on the Moderna vaccine, um, including um, what you know what to do about allergies. Any site that offers vaccine also has the ability to treat al allergic reactions on the spot. And that's whether it's an anaphylactic reaction, or 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 a few hives. Um, so the the um, there are um, the, the uh, precautions are for Moderna is that if you have a known allergy to Moderna, which of course most people won't, or to any of the components. The main component of concern is is what's called PEG, P-E-G, which is a kind of one of the carriers of the vaccine. Um, and so if people have a known allergy to that, then they would not be, uh, they would be advised not to take the, the vaccine. The other components are actually re really re very few. Um, and I think that's why allergic reactions, uh, serious allergic reactions are actually um, proving to be to be rare with uh, Moderna, but we know that that is always a risk with any vaccine is the risk of a serious uh, allergic reaction, and that's why we have epinephrine. Uh, we uh, we ha that's why trained any immunizer is trained both to recognize and to treat uh, an allergic reaction on the spot, and then appropriate measures take place um, for um, for whatever care is needed after that initial response. Thank you. We'll move to Claudiane, Radio-Canada. Uh, yes, first question for the Premier. Wondering if um, the uh, money announced today by Ottawa for Indigenous communities, there's a lot of money in there. Uh, how, much new, how much money the Yukon is getting? How much is new money and what will it be used for? Uh, I'm, I don't have that information in front of me right now, Claudiane, so I, I can't answer the question. Okay, I would like uh, then. Uh, I mean, by email, if if yep. you guys get the 
um, the follow-up on that bill, $4.2 billion that was announced this morning by Minister Miller yep. for Indigenous Communities. Second question for Dr. Henley. I'll ask in English for the benefit of my colleague, but I'd like the answer also in French. Wondering if eventually, and if not, why not, uh, if pharmacies, um, doctors, medical clinics, home care nurses will also be called in to uh, distribute the vaccine. Okay, I, I, I think you're putting Andre out of a job here by, um, <laughs> he's giving me his thumbs up. Donc, je vais essayer d'expliquer. We are now, on a certain pharmaciens qui sont déjà uh, inclus dans le, comme provisionnaires de vaccins. Donc, uh, et, 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 il y, mais, mais vous parlez plus de la distribution de vaccins. Et donc, uh, on attend que c'est, probablement, c'est plus pratique avec les produits qui, pour l'avenir, les, les produits à venir, qui sont beaucoup plus faciles, qui sera plus facile pour nous pour, pour faire la distribution. Par exemple, la, la, la produit AstraZeneca qui a, qui a des conditions de, de mobilisation, de réfrigération, plus, plus comme les, les vaccins normaux. Uh, mais, mais avec Moderna, c'est c'est tellement spécifique les conditions de congélation, de distribution, même quand on sort le vaccin de, de congélation de moins 20 degrés, il, il faut minimiser les mouvements parce que chaque mouvement, ça, ça risque, euh, euh, ça risque de, euh, de manque de, 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 de perdre la puissance du vaccin. Donc, c'est les, les, les conditions tellement étroites, tellement strictes, qu'il faut vraiment centraliser euh, la, la provision de vaccin pour cette campagne. Et c'est pour ça qu'on fait le maximum de centraliser euh, aux con, centres de convention, à part de, les efforts dans les, dans les centres de, de soins prolongés. Et puis, avec les les équipes mobiles. Euh, logistiquement, c'est très compliqué selon les, les, les précisions du, du compagnie de Moderna. Uh, I'll just translate quickly just that um, the question is about distribution to doctors' clinics and and other uh, pharmacists and other places. This is not a vaccine that lends itself to that kind of peripheral distribution just because it's the conditions are so strict for storage, for keeping it frozen, for um, even um, <clears throat> movement, even though you do have a lot, even though it is a lot more uh, uh, flexible than Pfizer, uh, the Pfizer product, which is why we chose Moderna, it's still very strict in how it can be moved around once you get to a location. And uh, uh, so um, I guess the other thing which I didn't mention in French, pardon, mais, uh, it was that we want we do not do not want to waste a single dose. We have an obligation to aim for zero wastage of doses. Um, and because the vaccine is so precious at the moment, And so we are very, very um, stickly, uh, sticklers for detail, and that's why we have centralized this as much as possible, apart from the, the mobile teams taking it to the communities, the long-term care, and the efforts uh, at, at the hospital, and the hospital as of today is doing a great job in how they are giving vaccine to their own um, frontline staff. Thank you. We'll move to Hina, Canadian Press. Hi, um, uh, how are you, Dr. Henley? Uh, I was wondering if you could just clarify for me uh, that uh, you said the territory could reach herd immunity within three months. Uh, is that uh, with both shots or with just one shot? Yeah, thank you. So that the the, the aim is for uh, that's where all the second dose planning comes in. But that is to have to to be fully vaccinated means you have your two shots. So our aim is for uh, the end of March. I always give a little wiggle room uh, saying into the beginning of April because things always happen. Um, but really, that is our aim: is first quarter um, or early into the second quarter success at uh, achieving that seventy five percent uptake uh, amongst our adult population. Do you have a follow-up, Hina? 
Yeah, uh, that's incredible. Uh, it will be the first place in Canada to uh, have that. Uh, and I was also wondering uh, if uh, uh, you could tell me whether uh, you are looking at or if uh, the government uh, in Yukon is looking at, uh, although the first case was uh, 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 officially on March 22nd, how far back do you think Yukon had the COVID uh, virus transmitting uh, or uh, uh, being in the area, how how long uh, do you think it had been? It it went undetected. I think about March twenty first. Um, <laughs> um, I you know it, it's hard to say. I I think that we were very uh, probably you know the risk at that time was um, uh, because there was a rapid uh, surge um, in in the southern provinces. Uh, there is a possibility that there was an importation and that it was uh, treated at you know treated as a kind of everyday influenza illness and and not otherwise recognized. Um, I do feel, uh, but but. I think if that happened, it happened to a limited extent because what we did not see was on, you know, suddenly unexpected areas where transmission was occurring. We didn't see, you know, hospitalizations popping up, all of those things that you would have expected to see and which other places in Canada did see once they sort of had that undetected uh, uh, and beginnings of community transmission. So I think it's quite possible that it occurred and we missed it, uh, but I, I don't think it occurred actually that much. So I would be surprised if we had significant activity before, um, you know, February, March. Um, this study may help us to, to determine that or to sort of lean us one way or the other. Thank you. We'll go now to Haley, Yukon News. And I had earlier, it was mentioned that um, obviously to getting to 75% depends on the vaccine doses being delivered as scheduled. Is there any um, concern about that at this time? Um, I think every jurisdiction is going through the very similar um, uh, concerns, uh, and, I, and I don't just mean in Canada. Um, you know, we had conversations with the Prime Minister about, you know, his trepidation, making sure that uh, when they get delivered, they're being uh, expedited as, as safely and as quickly as possible. Uh, you know, when, with Moderna... Uh, we can't hear the question. Can you hear me answering? Uh, anyway, uh, the question was if we have any issues on the distribution and, and you know, the, the timing of the of the distribution in the first quarter. Um, what I've been seeing from all, all uh, accounts, though, Haley, is uh, is things do get expedited uh, as opposed to we're being worried that things are slowing down. Uh, as the supply chain management gets figured out internationally, as Moderna takes a look at which countries are ready for second doses, uh, we have no reason to believe that whether it's in Canada or, or sorry, in Yukon or in the rest of Canada, that uh, the medical teams right across Canada will ha will not have the ability to to uh, to get these vaccines in people's arms as quickly and as safely as possible. Uh, with that being said, you know we still have uh, a long way to go in in making sure that we can nail down the dates of of those final uh, doses. So we do know that the there's a, uh, another 7,200 arriving this week, um, and uh, we, you know we again have been communicating. I communicate with uh, Dominic LeBlanc and uh, Christia Freeland, uh, the minister, federal ministers, and the prime minister, and, and our calls. Um, and you know we're all facing the same uh, same things in each jurisdiction. Other than in Yukon, we do have that commitment of, of having uh, the vaccines front end loaded compared to other jurisdictions. So when we're trying, like to, to echo Dr. Hanley's uh, words earlier, you know we we're not going to have to go too far down critical workers into essential workers and prioritizing because the general population through uh, vaccinations and understanding of those scheduled uh, um, deliveries will catch up to uh, to that uh, process and then we'll just have general population folks in line for vaccines. Next question, Haley. Yeah, actually I have a, a real follow-up question this time. Um, I wanted to know, uh, there is another delivery happening this week with 7,200. Have there been other delivery dates confirmed? And if not, um, what's preventing those firm dates? Probably a good question for, for Ottawa uh, as far as those, those firm dates. Um, you know, 
we we've had uh, preliminary conversations about um, the the distribution of Moderna in Canada, and every time that we get updates, we do get good news. And you've been reporting on you know uh, more vaccines than than what we uh, anticipated d delivering in, it being delivered in Canada. So again, uh, I, I don't see a lot of alarm to think that uh, we're not going to get uh, our vaccines in the first quarter, but I do agree with Dr. Hanley, we might have to allow for some flex room for the distribution of those if we get those, uh, our final doses uh, you know, in the end of March compared to the beginning of March. But, but all, all signs so far show us getting vaccines quicker than what, what we thought in, in December as opposed to worrying about getting it further than, than that. I know I've always said that I would have loved to have gotten the vaccines all delivered right away, um, but but uh, again, that was, uh, uh, you know, we, we have uh, our, our 72 and our 72 delivered now, and we're going to continue to work with Ottawa to make sure that as, um, as they get delivered, they get vaccinated as quickly as possible. Because we, we, we now have the training in place. We, we now have, you know, the safety considerations that are specific to Moderna figured out. So as they arrive, we'll be able to every week get them out even more expeditiously. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to thank everyone for their time today. The next COVID-19 update will take place on Wednesday, January 20th.